I want to welcome you to Exodus. My name is Kyle Waters. I'm one of the uh, elders here. Um, I've been, uh, my family's been here since uh, the summer of, uh, or been at Exodus since the summer of 2018. Um, I've been an, an elder for a few months. And so um, it takes a little bit getting used to and everything. Um, but when we think about this season, when we think about Christmas, uh, when we think about the coming of Christ at His birth, what do you think about? Anybody notice the, some of the videos on Facebook um, yesterday with, with uh, Josh and Zach when they did their strongman competition? And you see them get pumped and before they lift that weight? Well, I'm telling you, this, that's what we should feel when we come to this time of the year. This, that, that, that excitement, that, uh, that boldness, um, that getting pumped, getting excited, um, that's what we should look forward to when we celebrate, not that Christ is only has come, but that He is coming and He's building His kingdom. So it's a little bit of cliche, but with the Christmas lights and everything going on, this is my favorite time of the year. Anybody with me? Um, what do you like about about this time of the year. What is your favorite thing? Carols. carols. You got the carols. Uh, Christmas parties. Anybody? Christmas parties. All right. The food. The food. Decorating. Christmas cookies. All right. And you like baking them or eating them better? Eating them. All right. Um, football bowl games. That's what I really enjoy. Um, oh, man. <laughs> I didn't have to say that. <laughs> I had, we hadn't had very much luck with Tigers the last few years. Um, Clemson, LSU, and Auburn. Uh, anyway, Christmas cards, Christmas carols, uh, Christmas parties, time with friends and family. But even there's, there's many. There are, there are many that... Um, they, they struggle this time of year because of the, men, the memories of the past, uh, because of the loss of loved ones, and because of the good times and the happy times they had, um, because families get together in this time of year. Uh, they enjoy their time. Um, so those of us, uh, let's come around, let's encourage them, and let us not just remember the good times with our family, uh, but let us remember that, Christ sent, that God sent His Son to Christ. And let us look forward to to Christ coming again, to restoring, recreating this world, um, and making all things right. And in, in this hustle and bustle, Christmas parties, getting gifts for people, traveling down to uh, different states or different areas and towns to be with friends and family, um, let's reorient our time. This series, The Hope of the World, is, is for that purpose, reorienting our minds to that purpose. What should we be focused on? Um, let us praise God for His salvation. The light of the Gentiles, the King of Israel. We celebrate the birth of the King, and He has given us hope. When we meet with friends and family, or people that we meet in the store, let us always be ready to give an answer to the hope that lies within us. Let us adore Him. As we think about the baby in the manger, and the shepherds, and the wise men. But also, let us bow the knee to Him. Because that Christ does not stay a baby in the manger. He is the righteous branch. He is the, the King of Israel. In the previous weeks, we heard the prophecies of Isaiah, and he spoke of true peace and shalom with God. Peace with God and peace with our neighbor. We saw Isaiah. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Last week in Zephaniah, we heard that the king of Israel, the Lord, is in our midst. We heard Zephaniah prophesy how the king, the Lord, will clear away the enemies, gather the outcasts, and save the lame, causing worship, love, praise, and rejoicing that the king has come multiple times. Zephaniah quotes the Lord saying, I will gather those who mourn 
for the festival. I will change your shame into praise. I will. I will. Is there any wonder when we see in our passage today how the Lord works again? The Lord works. He declares the end from the beginning. We have no need for fear and trembling because the Lord is faithful. We see our hope. We see the world's hope. The hope of justice and righteousness brought by the righteous branch. Read with me in Jeremiah 33, 14 and 16. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days, and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. And he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. When Jeremiah says that these days are coming, it's not what's going on here in Jeremiah's lifetime. Jeremiah, he lived at a very difficult time. What were the days of Jeremiah like? He lived and prophesied during the reigns of Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoachin, and Zedekiah. That's the last kings of the southern kingdom of Judah. If you can say all those, um, please teach me. Um, with those kings, he saw the good and the evil. The rising and the prosperity and the falling back into darkness. Even in our day, we look around, what do we see? What would what would the United States look like with a righteous king? Now we always try to think, especially since the the uh, Declaration of Independence from the king and all the writings and everything in, in American history, all kings are evil. <laughs> But not the righteous king, not the righteous branch. If we had a righteous king, we would have hope. We think about all the things in our political system and the evils that we should fight and speak against in our, in our world, in our country today. If there was really a righteous king, what would life be like? How about in our homes? What would it be like if our our fathers ruled their house like a righteous king? Not domineering or taking advantage of, but teaching, loving, and disciplining. Not to destroy, but to build up, to encourage, to grow, to strengthen. What kind of turmoil would be in our homes if we actually had a righteous king? It would be none. If every man ruled his house, if our country had a righteous king, if the world could look to a righteous king, what would the world look like? How different would it be? At the beginning of Jeremiah's life and, and his early ministry, Josiah was the reformer king. He had found the book of the covenant in the temple. He had torn down many of the high places. He had submitted himself and repented of his sin and what his nation had done and what his father and grandfather had done. He reformed Judah. He celebrated the Passover for the first time in a generation. Yet, with all the good things that Josiah had done, and evil kings come after him. His sons did not share the love for the Lord. And they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord used Jeremiah to prophesy judgment on Josiah's sons. 
We see in Jeremiah 22, the Lord speaks judgment on, Je- on, on Jehoahaz, Josiah's son. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness. And his upper rooms by injustice. Who makes his neighbors serve him for nothing. And does not give him his wages. Can you imagine someone like that? A king? A politician? Someone that may have power or authority over another? Just takes advantage of them, use them, pay them for a lot less than they're worth for their work. Cheats people out of things that they deserve. He also says in verse 18 of Jeremiah 22, But you have eyes and a heart only for dishonest gain, for shedding of innocent blood, and for practicing oppression and violence. We see this kind of evil in our world today. We've seen this kind of evil in our world throughout the history of the world. The poor, the weak are taken advantage of. The the widow and the orphan, they suffer. Unwed single mothers and their children suffer from lack of necessities. They are the ones targeted by the abortion industry and liberal policies. They are the ones that are taken advantage of and used to champion the liberal cause. Notice where all our abortion places are usually in the poorest neighborhoods. Josiah, Jehoahaz, I'm sorry, he was deposed by by Egypt, the Pharaoh of Egypt. And his brother Jehoiakim raised in his place. But it doesn't get any better with Jehoiakim because he would not listen to to the Lord. Jeremiah speaks to Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord. And I spoke to you in prosperity, but you said, I will not listen. This has been your way from your youth, that you have not obeyed my voice. So Jehoiakim also was deposed and carried off to Babylon. And his son, Jehoiachin, reigned in his place. Jehoiachin, again, Did not sit long on the throne before Nebuchadnezzar deposed him and carried him off to Babylon. For he too did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord, as his father had done. Zedekiah, Jehoiakim's uncle, reigned in his place. Brothers and sisters, what would our nation be like? What would our homes be like if every man ruled his house? As a righteous king. Our sons would see that. By the grace of God, our sons could could grow into righteous kings also. Of their house, their communities, of their churches. But even Zedekiah, the uncle of Jehoiachin, did not reign righteously. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign and reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And he did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. The Lord was patient with him. Over and over the Lord sent Jeremiah to reason with Zedekiah to pass judgment. Zedekiah actually got so mad he threw him into prison, um, locked him up. About that same time, Jeremiah was thrown into the stocks by the high priest and thrown into a cistern also. What became of Zedekiah? Nebuchadnezzar blinded him and carried him off to Babylon. Jeremiah had seen the renewal days, the good days. It's those good old days. The reformer of the reformer Josiah. Everything looked good and prosperous in those early days. Yeah, he suffered a lot. He suffered much at the hands of Josiah's sons. 
He had been thrown into prison, stocks, and the cistern. He had seen Josiah fulfill the prophecy of, destructing, of the destruction of the, the altar at Bethel that Jeroboam had set up 400 years earlier. He had seen it. He had seen the word of the Lord be fulfilled. He had seen the keeping of the Passover for the first time in a generation. He had made a lament with all the men and women singers of the temple in Israel at the death of Josiah. He had called this Josiah's son, those evil kings, to repent and obey the Lord for the good of themselves and the good of God's people. Yet with all the judgment that the Lord spoke through Jeremiah, the pouring out of judgment, we always see hope the hope of justice and righteousness. Jeremiah 33, 14, The Lord declares the days are coming, the future day when the Lord would fulfill the promise they had made to Israel and Judah, the promise that He would restore them again to the land, the promise to the exiles who had no land, to restore the fortunes of the land where shepherds would have their sheep, people could live in peace, A land to be fruitful and to multiply in. A land, as Adam had in the garden, as Adam was meant to do, was to grow and keep it and to expand that garden. And the pinnacle of that promise was the righteous king that would rule over that kingdom, over that land, over those former exiles. This wouldn't be done by the power of the people, But God himself would do it. Verses 14 and 15, God says, I will fulfill. I will cause. How would the Lord fulfill this promise? By causing the righteous branch of David to spring up. God had promised David before, long ago. I will rise up for you, an offspring after you. Who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. This is the best part. Solomon builds the temple, but Christ is building the temple. Living stones. And I will establish his kingdom forever. And I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. However, the promise does not start with David. The promise of a righteous redeemer starts in the garden with the snake-crushing redeemer, the snake-crushing seed of the woman, with the offspring of Abraham. A small seed grows into a tree, and a root, a branch. This offspring of Abraham in which all nations of the earth would be blessed. This branch is Jacob's ladder. He is pictured in the life of Joseph as he saved many people. He is the Passover lamb of the Exodus. He's the rock that brings forth water in the wilderness. He's the commander of the Lord's armies that appeared to Joshua. He's the scarlet thread in the window of Rahab in Jericho. He's pictured in the judges that save God's people from their enemies. He's the perfect man after God's own heart. For the promises of God find their yes in Him. This is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to the glory of God. Paul says in Galatians, Now the promises that were made to Abraham and to his offspring, does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. The hope of this branch, doing what every other king of Israel and any other ruler or political ruler or president, even today, has failed to do. While Solomon was wise... Jeremiah's righteous branch was greater than Solomon. In the dark days of Jeremiah, 
God's faithful remnant was hoping for the promises of the glorious branch of the Lord. He had spoken of Isaiah 4.2. The remnant of Israel heard Isaiah 11 also, and he said, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from the roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what he sees, his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Think of Revelation, that's what you think of. The rod of his mouth and the breath of his lips. All God's judgment and wrath are not the end. That's not the purpose of the judgment and wrath. There's always hope in every prophet. It speaks of judgment and hope. God's wrath destroys and recreates. His judgment kills and resurrects. Jeremiah 30-33, we see the hope of God's people, the culmination of the promises of God, fulfilled in the righteous branch that the Lord causes to spring up. The righteous branch shall execute justice and righteousness no more Will the kings of Israel set up high places to these idols? No more will the kings of Israel sacrifice their sons to false gods as Manasseh had done. No more would the poor and the weak be used free of charge or slaves made out of God's people. No more would the shedding of innocent blood and violence be known among his people. No more would the weak and poor be taken advantage of. His kingdom would be a righteous kingdom that would come and destroy all the kingdoms of man and fill the earth. Jesus preached in Matthew 4, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the peoples of the earth would plot in vain, and the kings of the earth would set themselves against him. But when he was lifted up from the earth, He draws all men to himself. This righteous branch was presented before the Ancient of Days. He was given glory and an everlasting dominion. He has power and authority in heaven and on earth. And he is building his kingdom as we speak. And he's been building his kingdom for the last 2,000 years. This righteous branch, he executes justice. He is the standard maker for the world. If you don't believe that, just look at all the the rules of war in our modern world. The Geneva Convention is a testament. Whether you agree with all of it or not, it's a testament to the rule of Christ. Jesus is that righteous branch. He is the son of David. He is the root of Jesse. He's the offspring of Abraham. He's the seed of the woman. Paul quotes Isaiah 11.1 1 in Romans 15.12. The root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles will hope. Looking back at our main text. Why do the Gentiles hope in him? Verse 16 of Jeremiah 33, In those days Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. What does it mean that Jerusalem is called, The Lord is our righteousness? Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians 1.30 that Christ became to us, the wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Our righteousness is not of ourselves. 
We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have no righteousness within ourselves. We must look to Christ. Over and over in the Scriptures, we see the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. Over and over in the world today and throughout history, we see the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. Christ's righteousness is accredited to us. This is what Jerusalem, God's people, are called Christ, the Lord, is our righteousness. This is the banner of the church flies today. The Lord is our righteousness. If this don't get you pumped, I don't know what will. Our only hope is in Him, the branch, the Christ. Apart from Him, we are lost and dead in our sin, following the course of this world and the prince of the power of the air, carrying out the desires of the body, perverting justice, taking advantage of others, spilling innocent blood, as many in our day and our present time do. Which they do in rebellion to the King of kings and Lord of lords. And like Paul, brothers and sisters, we are to call people to repentance because God has fixed a day that He will judge the world in righteousness by the man, Jesus Christ, who was resurrected from the dead, We are the new creation in Christ Jesus. Ambassadors for Christ, the bride of the Lamb, the new Jerusalem. Therefore, Exodus Church, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Suffering comes. Hard times comes. Evil kings and rulers come. Bad legislation comes. Perversion comes. But he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another in love and good works, not neglecting the medium together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as we see the day drawing near. When evil men take advantage of the weak and pervert justice, When people rebel against the word of God and persecute the people of God. When innocent blood is spilt in abortion. And God is blasphemed. When genders are confused. When it seems like the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Trust in the righteous branch of the Lord. For he will fulfill and execute justice and righteousness. He established his kingdom, the church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. By be an ambassador for Christ through the power of the Spirit, work to plunder the powers of darkness, to build his church that is growing like that mustard seed that grows into a huge tree, and the birds of the air light or land in its branches. Work to be. To build Christ's church like the stone that Daniel spoke of that came from heaven and smashed the kingdoms of the earth and will fill the earth. Looking for the end to come, our blessed hope, Christ to return when the gospel of the kingdom has been proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to the nations. Brothers and sisters, we have work to do. And we have our marching orders. Because Christ is our righteousness. Jesus Christ is our hope. He's the world's hope. He's our righteous branch. Let us pray.